Praise the Lord. We're so glad that you're here on this wonderful Easter celebration morning. We thank you for coming into the house of the Lord. We thank those of you who are watching by way of the internet today. We welcome you also to the house of the Lord. And we've got a lot, a lot going on today. So we're going to get right into the service. Uh, let's just pray for those that we know are sick in their bodies and just ask the Lord to touch them today. If you know someone that's sick and needs a touch, would you just raise your hand? We're going to pray for them right now. Father, as you see the hands that have been raised, Lord, I thank you that you are the God that heals us, that sets us free, God. And we ask you to heal right now in the wonderful, lovely name of Jesus. Heal their bodies in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's sing this song that says, uh, He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today.
the children can go with Miss Pam in the back. They can go have the Easter egg hunt. I'll be indoors because of the weather. I want to remind you that uh, we are believing God for this property across the street. We've been mowing since 1948, but it doesn't belong to us, so we want it to belong to us. And so uh, I, I don't ask, I know it's Easter Sunday, I don't ask you to walk with me today. If you don't have the time or you've got somewhere you got to be, I will walk it myself uh, uh, to keep in step. But if you're willing to go with us and you want to, if you don't mind getting your feet a little bit dirty, because uh, it's wet over there, uh, just come follow me. Praise the Lord. But we are believing God to give us that property. And uh, these are needs that we have in the church. And just stretch forth your hand and let's pray. Father, you know every need inside of this envelope. And we give this to you. You are the author and finisher of our faith. And so, Lord, we ask. You said we have not because we ask not. And so we are asking you to meet all of these needs in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Tuesday week, uh, we are having our missions uh, rally for the South Georgia churches of the International Pentecostal Holiness Church. And uh, so uh, we'd love to have you join with us. You will need to make a reservation. It's free. It's just we need a head count to know how many to cook for. And uh, so uh, if you need help with that, just see me after church. Tell me your name and email address, and I'll put you on the list. And uh, if you don't know how to go online there and do that, I'll be glad to help you accomplish that. We want you here, uh, brother. Um, brother who I just forgot his name, Talmadge Gardner. Now, that's not a name you hear every day, is it? But Talmadge Gardner is our national missions director for the whole denomination around the world and is one of the godliest men. I just love to hear him talk. He is, uh, uh, I think, South African or either New Zealand or English because that's the accent that comes out of his mouth. But he is pure, 100%, walking around, Holy Ghost-filled man of God. And he has been elected as our, um, once again, as our missions director for all of our denomination. And so I, he's going to be at our church. He'll be in Jack's, uh, St. Augustine uh, Monday night with me over there. And then Tuesday night he'll be here with us the South Georgia churches, and then we'll be traveling with uh, Brother uh, Dr. Trammell, who came, he's our GO offering uh, coordinator and director. He'll be with me in uh, Dover and in Ocala, and then uh, Brother Brian Nix, who is over our People to People ministry, will be with us down in uh, Fort Lauderdale and Tallahassee, I believe it is. So I'm going to be traveling a little bit here and there, a day here and a day there uh, over the next couple of weeks, starting next Monday. And so I'll have my phone on. We're still available. Lisa will be here to uh, hands-on if you need anything uh, from me. She'll be glad to help uh, take care of anything that, that uh, you might need. Well, welcome to another Easter Sunday service. But today is going to be just a little bit different. I struggle and I struggle and I struggle because I've always preached a message about the risen Savior on Easter Sunday morning. And the Holy Ghost would not turn me loose from the subject that I am going to share with you today. And I, I believe it's a needful uh, message. It's a timely message, and it may not be for anybody in this room. It might be for somebody watching by way of internet. It might be that you have children that are struggling in these areas, or brothers or sisters 
nieces and nephews, but I know this. If I asked you to raise your hand, and I'm not, if I asked you to raise your hand, do you have anybody in your family that is under the influence of drugs or alcohol, perversion, uh, anger, frustration, bitterness, any of those type of things? I believe we'd have 100%. In fact, I think if we just simply said, how many you had in this room have somebody in your family that's addicted to alcohol and drugs, almost everybody would raise their hand because it has become a national problem. It has become a worldwide problem. And we're seeing our young folks being murdered by abortion, and we're seeing our teenagers and young adults murdered by drugs and alcohol. I talked to the field director in my last area where we pastored down in Florida, and he shared with me, he said, Pastor Randy, he said, I have, I have done more funerals this year. Well, I just did a recent funeral down there. He said, I've done more funerals this year than I have for any elderly people that died of heart attacks, liver disease, kidney disease, whatever. I've done more funerals for overdoses. My wife was telling me in the news last night there's some new uh, drug that's being added to regular uh, medications and drugs that are sold on the street that is taking the place of fentanyl. And I cannot remember the name of it, but it is uh, very, very deadly. I was so troubled by it that I called my oldest daughter, who is struggling uh, with addictions, and for the first time in eight months, she picked up my call. This morning, and I'm just so overwhelmed and blessed that she said, Daddy, I love you. I love you. I'm sorry, you know, that I'm in all this, but she said, I just want you to know I love you. You know, that means a lot when you have a child that's living in the streets and you don't know where they're at any time, day or night. And You know, you take a baby and you hold them in your arms and you take care of them and you raise them and you bring them to the church and you do everything that you're supposed to do. And, and then all of a sudden, in the 18 to 20-something realm, they, they find friends that <coughs> introduce them to this so-called high. And then they're addicted. And for many years, they struggle and struggle. Alicia and I have been watching, as I told you, a series called The Waltons. And I know all of you grew up around the Waltons or watched them a few years ago when they were on in the 70s and, and repeats in the 80s and the 90s and the 20s and the 2010s and the 2020s. And we're doing it again. We're watching them again because we just love that time period. But... We didn't realize how much alcohol had taken over the father of the Waltons and the mother, Olivia, and both of them were bound by alcohol for many years, even up to the time of the middle of the series. They were still struggling. They looked like the, the absolute perfect people in all the world, and, and, and their show certainly demonstrated them to have it all together. But behind the scenes, they were struggling with alcohol. In Genesis chapter 9, as we continue in the story of the book of Genesis, we're going to look in verse 18 through 25. Genesis 9, 18 through 25. One of the biggest and greatest blessings that we can have this morning is the Easter story. It's the story that Jesus rose from the dead. He became victorious over sin, death, hell, and the grave. And if we will just turn to him, he will set us free and give us the victory that we need over sin. So let's see what happens in Genesis 9, 18. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah. 
and these the whole earth and from these the whole earth was populated and Noah began to be a farmer and he planted a vineyard then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent and Ham the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside but Shem and Japheth took a garment laid it on both of their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness so Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants. He shall be to his brethren. Noah has been on the ark for almost a year. He has smelled the animals. He has scooped out the, the manure. He has put up with his wife and daughter-in-laws and sons who have probably all complained, and even him himself has probably complained. God, will this ever end? Will this ever stop? Will we ever be able to be back on dry ground? Will we ever have anything called normal again? Well, he's out of the ark, and now he's doing something that he believes he can do. He becomes a husbandman. He becomes a farmer, and he grows wine. He grows vineyards to make wine. I don't know if you've ever studied much on that, but, you know, you don't grow grapes and make wine overnight. My wife and I planted some uh, uh, grape uh, vines in our yard, and the first year they probably got about three foot tall, produced about eight grapes apiece, and that was about the extent of it. And this year, they've grown up to be about six and seven feet tall. I haven't seen yet what, it's not the time, it's not the season yet, but, but we, we expect maybe just a little bit more. But for a man <coughs> to produce a vineyard that would have enough grapes to produce wine from it, he would have to have a large garden and it would take a couple of years well he lives his life on this earth with no other people to talk to other than his wife and his children and now they're having children and and, and so life is going on but life is still kind of confusing and life is is not the way that they think it might ought to have been and he misses his his relatives and his family and his friends and people that he used to do business with. And now things are harder for him. And, and I'm here to tell you that today's children are struggling with things more than we struggled with when we were their age. When I was a kid, the worst thing I had to worry about is keeping away from my mama's switch. That was probably one of the, the, the hardest things I had to do. I had to mow the grass and wash the clothes and cook the food and take out the garbage and keep my room clean and mop the floors and vacuum the rugs and take care of the animals and all the other things that I was required to do. But I didn't have the pressure that the kids in our schools are having today. They're having to worry about their parents who maybe has been divorced or in the process of divorce. And maybe they're having to go through having a step, new stepmother, a new stepfather. Or maybe it's the second, mama's second or third or fourth boyfriend or daddy's second, third or fourth boyfriend. And, and they're going through identity crisis. They don't know if they're a, a man, a woman, or a, a he, she, or transgender. They don't know 
uh, what their uh, sexual orientation is because there's over a hundred now and they can't determine what am I and who am I and they are struggling with things and so here they come and and, and to erase the, 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 the hurting of their hearts they're turning to drugs and they're turning to alcohol one of the greatest problems that teenagers struggle with is alcohol. If you don't believe that, you come out here any Saturday and you help me pick up the beer bottles and the beer cans that are left all over the church property. Every church I've ever pastored, I've had to pick up beer cans and beer bottles because people somehow think it is so funny to toss those things out in the Lord's property. But I'm here to tell you, I don't want you to see them, so I pick them up and I throw them away. So if you go out in that dumpster and you see those bottles, it wasn't us drinking those <laughs> things. <laughs> it was our good, blessed neighbors. Hallelujah. But the truth of it was, Noah drank some wine and he became drunk. And he got to the place where he stripped off all of his clothes and he laid around and just do what alcoholics do. And he was just struggling and struggling and struggling to the point that he passed out naked. Well, his son Ham comes in and, oh, 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 look at daddy. He's naked. I don't know about you, but that is the last thing in the world you ever <laughs> want to see is your parents naked. That is not something on your bucket list, okay? I'm here to tell you that will traumatize you and make you go to therapy for a long time. And Ham saw his father's nakedness, and instead of showing the respect that he needed to show him, he laughed and went outside and found Japheth and Sham and said, Hey, go in there and look at your old man. He, that old godly man that found grace in the eyes of the Lord, is drunk and passed out. Now, we don't know why Noah got drunk. Now, the scripture basically said that uh, Noah began to be a farmer at this point in his life. He might not have known the effects of fermented wine. He may not have known. So we have to give him that possibility that he didn't know. But let's just say he did know. He might have known from seeing other people or other folks that drank the wine and became intoxicated. And they learn from, from watching them the effects of what happens. But maybe, just maybe, after a couple of years of being on the earth and realizing I got nobody to talk to, I got nobody but my own family here. The pressure is on me. And you know what happens to a lot of folks when they go through pressure? They fall to the influence of drugs or alcohol. And it is so important that... that, that uh, the Bible describes what happened next, that Ham finds his father naked, and then he tells his brothers. It's amazing to me that God, throughout the scripture, says Ham, father of Canaan. And when the curse came, when the curse came that God gave to Ham, he didn't curse Ham, he cursed his son. And I will tell you what, you hurt me all you want, all day long, and I can take it. But you hurt my kids, and I'm helpless. You hurt my kids, and I don't know what to do. When you hurt my children, you've hurt me worse than you could ever hurt me with anything else. Noah was a righteous man, but he was a man. And Noah fell 
to the temptation of becoming under the influence of alcohol. We're all working on something in our lives. If I went around the room and I said, tell me what you're working on and you weren't embarrassed, some of you would say, well, I'm working on getting off of pornography. Some of you would say, I'm coming off of alcohol. Some of you would say, I'm trying to quit uh, this substance abuse. Some would say, well, I'm trying to get out of worry. I worry too much. Some of you would say, I get frustrated so easy. Some of you would say, I have an anger issue, and I constantly get mad for no reason, and I don't even know why I'm getting mad, but I'm getting mad. Well, there's one thing that happened when all of humanity was destroyed with the flood. The demons that had lived on that earth in the atmosphere that tormented men day and night that got them to the place where all they thought about was evil continually, those spirits were still around. They did not drown in the flood. They were still there tormenting. But now instead of hundreds of thousands of people or millions of people that died in the flood, now there's only Noah, his wife, his three children, and their wives and now all of these spirits are bombarding this man of God. And they're bombarding his family. And, and we just don't know exactly, but we know one thing. Ham is not a righteous man. Because he's laughing at his father's nakedness. He's not honoring his father. He's not doing what he's supposed to do. You can be a righteous man. And you can struggle with things. Now, I, I, I want to I be perfectly clear this morning. You can be born again and be struggling with a spirit whispering in your ear, tormenting you day after day after day. You can struggle with things and you, my friend, need deliverance. You say, what does that mean, Pastor? It means that you got to pray until, as the old timer said, you've prayed through. And if that doesn't work, if you can't somehow get the victory on your own, you need to drop your pride and you need to call a man of God or a woman of God, somebody that you know knows how to touch God, and you need to say, I'm struggling with frustration. I'm struggling with loneliness. I'm struggling with fear. I can't, I can't go to bed at night because I'm afraid somebody's going to break in my house. I can't drive my car because I'm afraid I'm going to have an accident. I can't do anything because I'm scared all the time. That is a spirit that is following you and tormenting you. And you need deliverance from it. The Bible says to draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Resist the devil. And what will he do? He'll flee from you. He'll be gone. But see, we don't do our part. We just put up with him. We just say, that's just a part of it. And I've always been that way. I had a lady one time, she was, she, she was just mean and nasty. And, and I asked her one time, I said, you know, sis, you're mean and nasty. <laughs> and she said, I'm always that way. That's just who I am. And people are just going to have to accept me for the way that I am. And I said, no, people are not going to have to accept you for the way you are. And if you want to make it into heaven, you need to get the victory over that. You can't make it into heaven hating people and people hating you and you causing all that. You've got to get rid of that. You've got to come against that spirit. This week, knowing this message was coming up, I've been under severe mental and emotional attack. I looked over at my wife a couple of nights ago, and I said, you need to pray for me. I said, because I, I don't remember being under attack like this before. I am not a quitter. I don't believe in it. It's not in my DNA. But the devil was saying, you need to quit. You need to go on and resign your church. You just need to go work at, at uh, Lowe's or somewhere and, uh, and, and get out of the ministry. These were thoughts that were running through 
this preacher's mind this week. And it wasn't just a fleeting thought. It was about three days of mental torment. And every time I do what the Word said, I'd draw nigh to God and resist the devil. And I'd say, I command you to flee from me in the name of Jesus because you've got no business. You've got no control over me. I will live and not die. I will declare the works of the Lord until I do die. I've got no plans to retire. I'm going to give God everything I have until I can't preach anymore. And then I'm going to visit and let somebody else do the preaching and I'm going to do the visiting and I'm going to lay hands on the sick and I'm going to cast out devils and I'm going to do all the things that the Lord's told me to do. I don't have to preach to be a pastor. I'm going to preach as long as I can and I'm going to serve the Lord as long as I can. But you know what? Noah was under a severe, I believe Noah was under a severe attack. All hail was H-E-L-L -L was coming against him as he's now had some time off the boat. And he's had to realize, you know what, things are not the way they used to be. My oldest daughter was raised. In fact, I told her this morning, I said, baby, you know. You know. If you ever surrender, you're going to wipe out hell. You're going to take so many people out of hell. Because you have such an anointing on your life and you have such a call on your life and you're so gifted and, and talented and God can use you. You've just got to surrender to the Lord. You do know that, don't you? She said, yes, Daddy. I know that. And I said, she got hooked up with a boy that I told her not to date. Did y'all ever date somebody your parents told you not to? Probably saying, yeah, I'm married to him. I'm sitting right here next to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I told her over and over, I said, that boy right there is never going to amount to anything. And I don't ever say that about people. But I, I said, honey, that boy is never going to take care of you. He's never going to be a good husband. He's never going to be a good provider. He has no aspirations. The only thing he lives for is to smoke weed. That is his top level goal in life. <laughs> well, as a lot of girls and a lot of guys do, she ran off and married the guy. And he introduced her not only to pot, but to coke and to uh, heroin and to all the other major <coughs> drugs that people get hooked on. And for the last uh, 15 years, basically, she has been hooked on all kinds of things. And, and I don't even know now what she's hooked on, but she's still hooked. And you see, this is a girl that was raised every Sunday morning, Sunday night and Wednesday night in church. She went to every youth camp that, that, that I could send her to. I sent her to the Assemblies of God one. I sent her to the Church of God one. I sent her to every youth camp I could find <laughs> Because I wanted my children to be exposed to Jesus. But even still, the enemy was able to snooker her and get her bound under the influence. What does it mean to be under the influence? Noah was under the influence of alcohol. What does it mean? You remember the guy that wrote that beautiful movie, The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson? I, I, I can hardly imagine a movie more moving that I weep through as I watch that movie as, as I realize what Jesus went through. Don't understand a word as they're talking in Aramaic and the words at the bottom. And normally I don't like to watch shows like that. But as I was watching that show, every single time I watch it, I weep and weep. And that man... The worldly he may be was anointed of God to make that movie. And yet right after that, he was arrested in Los Angeles County. The Sheriff's Department tested Mel Gibson's blood level at 0.12. When the limit is 0.08, he was released after posting a $5,000 bail and was sentenced to Alcoholics Anonymous. 
meetings five times a week for four and a half months and three times a week for the remainder of the first year of probation. He was fined $1,300 and his license was restricted for 90 days. Here's a man that could have such an anointing to make this preacher cry in a movie house. Is now so bound by alcohol that his whole credibility has been put in question. The movie itself, much of it was put into question because the devil's like, if I can just get this person under my influence, I'll ruin their testimony. Gibson said, I acted like a person completely out of control when I was arrested. I said things that I did not believe to be true, which were despicable. I'm deeply ashamed of everything I said, and I apologize to everyone that I offended. He was under the influence. I had an uncle, I won't say his name in case my relatives are watching, but he was 70 some odd years old and I saw him at a wedding and, and I said, hey uncle so and so and he said, hey Randy, he said, I want you to know I've been 60 days free of alcohol. Now here's a man that drank a 24 pack of Budweiser, the tall Budweiser beers and then chased it down with vodka afterward. He had an outhouse that he kept his stacks of Budweiser from the bottom to the top so while he was sitting on the toilet, he could still keep drinking and not miss a beat. That's an alcoholic. He goes out to this wedding and gets drunker than Cooter Brown like he always did and his head wound up in the punch bowl. And he said, Randy, I don't know how it got there. <laughs> so I knew it had to be the drinking. I'm thinking, you've been drinking for 60 years, and you just now figured out <laughs> that getting your head in the punch bowl was what convinced you you needed to quit alcohol. <laughs> My other uncle who lived next door to him, <clears throat> he was a great man. He he ran county uh, businesses and, and was a very important man in society, worked every day, didn't miss. He was a working alcoholic. But he got so drunk that when he went out to his dock to dive off into the, to the creek, he missed the dock and hit the boat ramp and busted all of his teeth out of his head. He had the gum in his stakes from that day till the day he died. And I knew it's because he was under the influence. I had a dear man come into church in Tampa when I was pastoring down there. And he said, Pastor, I'm bound by alcohol. And I said, if you will submit to God, God will set you free. And uh, he said, well, uh, I I'll think about that. Well, he goes back home. That night he gets so drunk that he takes a can of gasoline and pours it over the top of his head. And he's in there looking for a match to light it because he wants to end his life because he's so miserable from the alcohol. And his wife, thank God, was able to get a hold of 911. And then she called me, and we both got there about the same time, and the police strong-armed him. And and he looked at me and he said, Preacher, I'm so sorry. I said, You need to tell God you're sorry. And they stuck him on a on a one of them uh, stretcher things and put him in the back of the wagon and hauled him to Tampa General Hospital. I waited a day because I don't like to talk to drunks, and I waited till the next day when he was sober. And I went to the hospital and he said, Pastor, will you please beg these people to let me have a shower? He said, I got all that gasoline all over me. I said, you deserve it. He said, what? I said, I'm going to pray they leave you here for three days with no bath. And if that alcohol burns your skin, that you'll come to my office and pray. Let us pray to get you set free. Well, not only did God give me my prayer because he didn't get a shower for three days, and then they took him out, out of the hallway of Tampa General Hospital to the mental ward. And he was not crazy. 
What he did was crazy because he was under the influence, but he was not crazy. And he goes to the mental ward and they stick him in a room with a guy that still thinks he's in World War II. And he comes up to him and he says, get your gun, soldier. We got to go fight the enemy. And he says, I just want to go to sleep. God hounds him and hounds him and hounds him about getting his gun so he has to finally run around the nut house with him just to get him to leave him alone. And he calls me on the phone. He says, Preacher, you know I'm not crazy. Will you please tell them to let me out of here? I said, I will not do it. You need to stay there. And when you get sick and tired of that alcohol, you come to my office. And I'm going to lay some oil on your head and I'm going to pray over you and you'll never drink again. He said, Preacher, I promise to God if you tell them to let me out. I said, No. After they let you out, you come to my office and I'll lay my hands on your head. You said, You're a cruel preacher. Don't you get drunk and call me. I ain't going to be your best friend. I'm not going to be the guy that gets you out of jail. I don't get my own children out of jail. I ain't getting you out of jail. <laughs> he comes to my office and he gets on his knees and he's weeping his head off and he said, I've busted walls in my house and I've hit my wife and I've done all this crazy mess that got me put in the hospital and no shower with gasoline all over me and, and then seven days in the, in the mental ward and I'm out now, and I'm clean, and I'm in a sober mind, and I want to quit alcohol, preacher. You said you'd lay hands on me and pray. I said, get on your knees right now. He got on his knees, and I slapped oil on his head, and I said, in the name of Jesus, you spirits of alcohol, come off of him now in Jesus' name. That man hit the floor, and he came to he hugged my neck and said, thank you, I'm free for the first time in my life. I don't have that, that whirling around my head just screaming at me constantly to go get a drink, go get a drink, go get a drink. He said, I don't want to. And as long as I stayed in that church, I never saw that man under the influence of alcohol again. But you see what under the influence can do to you? You can be so mad all the time that you get under the influence of your own anger and you beat your wife or you beat your husband or you beat your children or you beat your dog or you put holes in the walls or, or you do stupid mess and you get fired all the time because you got such a hot head that you tell your boss he's stupid when he's the one signing your check. How many of you know that's sad? That is stupid. <laughs> That's under the influence of anger. I'm here to tell you that when you're under the influence of anything other than Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost, you are susceptible to do some crazy, crazy mess. I read in the paper a woman said, I was at a party and I got drunk and woke up with a guy I didn't know. I didn't really know what happened, but I'm scared we had sex and I don't know what to do. Dear Abby, what do I do? That's the story of so many people today who get under the influence. It's dangerous to be under the influence of drugs and alcohol. It's just as dangerous to be under the influence of frustration and anger all the time. It's just as, as, as dangerous to be under the influence of pornography all the time. There are eight or five stages of drunkenness. Stage one, I'm smarter than anybody in the world. You ever been around alcoholics and they're so smart they know everything? You can't tell them anything because they know everything. Stage two, I'm the most good looking thing in the world. You get a drunk person in the bar and it can be, they, they'll go up to the prettiest woman there and they'll ask her out for a date and they're as ugly as homemade sin and think they can get a date with this beautiful woman. But alcohol makes them think, I am something to behold. <laughs> the third stage of alcohol is, is rich because all of a sudden I go to the bar and I spend my whole paycheck 
buying everybody drinks because I want people to be my friends and I want people to like me. So I'm so rich, I start buying everybody. I'm, and plus, I'm still the best looking guy here. So everybody's going to want to, to have my beer. Stage four, I'm bulletproof. I can pick on the biggest and the baddest guy at the bar and, and, and I can lick him. I might be four foot two and 105 pounds and I can come against a 300 pound man that's been in the Marines and think I can beat him up because I'm smart and I'm good looking and I'm rich <laughs> and I'm bulletproof. That's what under the influence does for you. Stage five, I'm invisible. At that stage of drunkenness, at this point, nobody can see me. They don't see how foolish I am. They don't see how stupid I am. Why, I, I'm, so, I'm so handsome, and I'm so rich, and I'm so smart that they, they can't see me. And so I can scream at the top of my lungs. I can sing anywhere and everywhere. And everybody can be offended because I, I sing when I'm drunk and I party. I had two aunts that every time they were drunk, they'd call me and say, Randy, will you come play Amazing Grace on the piano? <laughs> you know how hard it is to sit there and sing? play Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found the two holy Amazing Grace how sweet the sound <laughs> horrible horrible singing but they think they're invisible and invincible the Bible teaches us in Ephesians 5.18 do not be drunk with wine where is an excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit's control that I want to be under. I, the Holy Spirit, has never caused me to spend my money uh, irrationally. I have never tried to pick up women under the influence of the Holy Ghost. In fact, I've never tried to pick them up under any influence. I barely picked up my wife. Thank God she was willing. Praise God. That's not my calling to be a man, a ladies' man. But to be under the influence of anything except the Lord is just sheer insanity. And this man, Noah, who thank God for Shem and Japheth, they, they take a, a, a covering, I can just imagine maybe a, a bed covering and and they walk backwards, one on one side, one on the other, and they walk backwards into the room. And their daddy's probably still silly, and he's probably still passed out and acting goofy. And they take and they throw that over their dad, and they honor their dad. But God cursed Canaan, Ham's son, to get Ham. Been many a time where I've wondered, God, did I do something in my life that caused my children to steer away from you? Is there anything that I did? You know, the Bible talks about the sons, the sins of the fathers visiting on the children to the third and fourth generation. I, I don't want to do anything that's going to cause sin to come into, into the lives of my son and my grandson and my great grandson. I, I, I won't I won't or pass down a godly lineage. I want to pass down an a influence of the Holy Ghost. I want them to say when I'm dead, Grandpa, great-grandpa, he listened to the Lord. He was a man of the Word. He was a man of the Spirit of God. We're to never be under the influence of anything but the Lord. When I'm under the influence of the Lord, I'm working with my full faculties because God is a gentleman and he will not force himself on me but he will remind me of his word he'll put in my mind you know when I'm thinking of doing something stupid or doing something wrong just in my natural body you know I, I, I had a I was at Kroger's yesterday and, and I didn't feel too good and I was still being tormented by the devil and I and I was just standing in line, and these, these, these people ran ahead.
ahead of me and got in line. Do you know what Randy Richardson wanted to do? <laughs> I wanted to run my buggy into their buggy <laughs> and force my buggy ahead of theirs. That's what your preacher wanted to do yesterday. And I wasn't under the influence of anything other than pure old self, 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 self. But immediately, thank God, because I wasn't under the influence of anything other than the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, you know, pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. He doesn't say run your buggy into them. It says pray for them. So I stopped right where I was at. I said, Lord, I, under my breath, I said, Lord, I forgive those people for jumping ahead of me in line. And may their ice cream melt before it gets on. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I prayed and I said, Lord, bless them. They might be in a hurry. Maybe they're on the way to the hospital. Maybe their wife's pregnant out in the car. I don't know. I, I said, God, but whatever the reason, or if they're just being mean, I forgive them. Forgive them now. And Lord, forgive me for even entertaining the thought of running my buggy into their buggy. You see, if I can have those kind of thoughts, I just wonder what in the world are y'all doing? <laughs> if I stay in the Word all the time and I'm praying all the time and I'm seeking the Holy Ghost all the time, I wonder what in the world y'all are doing out there. And that's why the Lord has me speaking on this subject today. What are you under the influence of what is your addiction? Several years ago, and I've told this story, but for those of you who didn't hear it, I'm going to tell it again. I was living in Tampa, Florida, and I had gone um, all day, and I realized I had no money in my checkbook. I had no money balance on my credit card, and, and I, I looked in all the piggy banks and the places behind the couch and under the couch for money and there was no money to be found in my house and I needed some ice cream I had had ice cream every night for over 20 years never missed a night even in the hospital I'd have my family bring me in some ice cream because I couldn't go to sleep if I didn't have ice cream. I was addicted to it. And that night, I jumped in my car and I realized I had an Amoco card. That's back when Amoco was a gas station. And I had, uh, you could buy stuff in the Amoco station along with your gas and, and, and you could buy ice cream at the Amoco store. So I went into the Amoco store, I put gas in my tank, and then I went in there and I bought, and do you know what? Amoco has the nastiest ice cream that's ever been made. I don't know what ingredients are in it, but it's not the natural normal things that you put into ice cream. It was so cheap and so nasty, but I quickly bought it. It was three times the cost that it was in every other store, but I didn't care because I was addicted to ice cream. So I brought that, that tub home, and as soon as I got home, my spoon went in. I didn't even wait to put it in a bowl. I started dipping right out of that, that bucket, and I started eating that nasty, nasty ice cream. And the Holy Spirit said, what are you doing? <laughs> and I realized, and I started counting back, and I started realizing that I had had an addiction for 20 years to something as silly as ice cream. And I said, Lord, I don't want anything having control. You know how some people say, I can't function without my coffee. That's you. You're addicted. You might just need to pray about it and not have it. Everybody knows this may happen. <laughs> <laughs> the whole row is laughing. Get under conviction, sister. <laughs> no, no. There's nothing wrong with coffee. But I said to myself, I don't want anything controlling me like that. That I would leave my house at 11 o'clock at night and use my Amoco card that has 20-something percent interest to buy a nasty bucket of ice cream and eat it even though it tasted horrible just to satisfy that old demon in me. I, I didn't want it. So I made a commitment that night. 
I said, Lord, for two years, I will not have a lick of ice cream. I will not go to a Dairy Queen. I will not buy ice cream in the store. For two years, I made a commitment to you that I'm not going to be under the bondage of ice cream. I see, I don't think that the Lord necessarily needed me for two years not to have it, but I, my brain, said, I know if I can lick this for two years, that Randy Richardson, it won't be a life-changing thing for him. And I did it. There were nights when I broke out on a cold sweat. <laughs> there were nights when I was miserable and couldn't sleep because all I could think about was going and getting some ice cream. And I think to myself, how do these people that are on heroin and crack and alcohol, how do they do it if it's just sugar in ice cream that I'm addicted to? How is it? When you get a taste of something, whether it's pornography or anger or frustration, if you don't curb your anger and, 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 and you carry on and, and, and you get used to it, it becomes part of you. And so what you have to do is say, Lord, I don't want anything to control me but the Holy Ghost. So you yield to the Lord and you say, Lord, I'm going to let you take over. Romans 7, 15 through 26 says, what? For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good, and now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in my flesh nothing good dwells. For to do is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will do I do not do, but the evil I will not do that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now, that's really a complicated scripture. But let me just say it like this. There's times I do things I don't want to do. And I, and I find myself doing them when I, when I know I shouldn't be doing it, but I do it anyway. That's what Paul's talking about. And he says, I find that a law that's evil is present with me, that one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inner man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity in the law of sin. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he says the answer, I thank God through Jesus Christ. I don't want anything possessing me, so what do I have to do? I have to go to the altar, and I have to give it to God. Now, that altar can be right where you're sitting. It can be in your in your, in your your uh, driver's seat in your car. It can be on your mowing uh, seat on your riding mower. It can be in your living room. It can be out by a tree behind your house. But there has to be a place where you get along with God, and you say, God, I'm sick of this. And I'm tired of this. And I'm tired of living like this. I'm tired of, of yielding to alcohol. I'm tired of yielding to drugs. I'm tired of yielding to anger. I'm tired of yielding to pornography. I'm tired of yielding to frustration. I'm tired of yielding to fear. I'm tired of yielding to loneliness. I'm tired of yielding to anything the devil has tried to put on me and make me wear it like a coat. Replace the addiction with another one. It's called prayer and Bible study. You see, when you start to have that temptation, you go get your Bible and you begin to read, and all of a sudden that, that, that torment and spirit can't stand you in the Word. And then you begin to pray and you seek the face of God. And God's Spirit will immediately begin to do a change Get your Holy Ghost filled music on. Begin to listen to your music and, and let the Spirit of God worship inside of you. 
Philippians 1, 21 says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Do you want to become new? It starts at that altar. Wherever that altar is, saying, God, I'm sick and tired of yielding to this. And then you pray and you read the word. But if you go even a week or two and you can't get the victory on your own, you find somebody you can trust that will lay hands on you and command that spirit to flee in the name of Jesus. And it will go in Jesus' name. It will go in Jesus' name. You got a woman. You got a woman. I watched a homosexual down at the altar one night. And that young man, the old ladies drug him down to the altar. So, number one, he wasn't on his own. He didn't go willfully. He went because all them old ladies grabbed him. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. Just them dear old saints of God grabbed and hold him and drug him down there. And they was going to force him to quit. Being a homosexual. And uh, how many you know if you don't want to quit something, you ain't going to quit it? He goes down there, and them old, them old girls, they had the power of God in them. And they prayed over him, and they said, Come out in Jesus' name. And that spirit left that boy. And it went up, and you can see his face going straight up as he sees that the spirit's leaving him. He begins to, forgive me for the, 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 the he begins to regurgitate and puke, and, 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 and next thing I know, and, and please forgive me, but this is a fact. He begins to scoop all that vomit up and puts it back in his yeah. mouth and yells out, Come back! Come back! I don't know how to live without you! Come back! I told those dear old saints, I said, Y'all did not do him a favor. Don't ever drag another person to my altar in the name of Jesus. Don't ever drag another person down to the altar until they're ready to come on their own. Do not drag them to the altar. They did him no favor. That man went right back into being a homosexual. In fact, he got worse. One day he was sitting in the back of the church and he was making fun of the folks that were getting slain in the spirit and, and dancing around and, and uh, jerking and other things that happen sometimes when the Holy Ghost hits somebody. And he was making fun of them. And I walked right off the pulpit and I went right down to his seat and I got right in his face and I called his name. And I said, if you are here to worship the Lord, you can stay here as long as you want. But if you keep making fun of God's people, I curse you and I command you to leave this building right now in Jesus' name. I said, you go, you're, not going to, you're not going to make fun of the Holy Ghost. You're going to get out of here right now. Well, he got up and he left. It was about a year or so later. He called me on the phone. He's living in, in uh, Chicago, Illinois. And he's crying his eyeballs out. And he says, Pastor, <clears throat> you're the only pastor that ever loved on me. You gave me a Bible. You counseled with me for hours and hours and hours. You, 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 you prayed for me many times. And I never would yield. He says, now I cannot, I cannot feel God. I cannot feel the touch of God. I can't feel anything. And I'm dying. I've got AIDS, Pastor. I've lived in this lifestyle so much. I've slept with so many people. I've been so addicted that I cannot get, I, I, I can't hear God anymore. And I said, let's pray. Let's pray, brother. And I began to pray for him. And as I was praying, it was like, you know, the heavens were uh, uh, brass and, and, and the earth was something else, whatever the Bible says it is, hard. And the prayer was going nowhere. And I could feel it. My prayer was going nowhere. And he said to me, I have a reprobate mind, and I have gone too far, and I cannot get saved. I'm going to die and go to hell. Pastor, I thank you for trying to tell me the truth, but I'm sorry I didn't listen to you. And I said, brother, let's keep praying. Let's pray on the mercy of God. He said, it doesn't matter. He said, 
they do that in that night in the morning. I'm hung up, and I never heard from him again. As far as I know, he died, and he's in eternity in hell right now. And it's haunting me, and haunting me, and haunting me. As I realize, <coughs> what could I have done any different? What could I have done any better? Because, see, he was addicted to sex in a perverted way. And there are so many people that are addicted to this and that and the other thing. And if they would just get help. I beg you this morning, this Easter Sunday, as Jesus rose from the dead and walked out victorious over the grave, you can walk victorious out of this building or you can walk victorious into your home today and be free in Jesus' name. But you've got to want it. Will you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person watching by way of internet that's bound by the devil. I pray for every person that's in this house that all of a sudden they'll have a wanter to want to be set free from whatever it is that they're bound by. I come against it right now in the name of Jesus. I bind every devil that's trying to keep them from getting deliverance. I bind it in Jesus' name. And I curse it in the name of Jesus. Now, under your breath, I want you to do this. Father, I repent of, and you name whatever it is that you're struggling with. Under your breath, in nobody's business between you and the Lord. I repent. I denounce alcohol. I denounce drugs. I denounce perversion. I denounce pornography. I denounce anger. I denounce loneliness and fear and frustration. I denounce anything that's holding me back from serving the Lord. And Lord, now I yield to you to fill me up. If I'm not right with you, Lord, I pray God right now in Jesus' name, you'll forgive me of my sins and come into my heart and make me a new creature in Jesus Christ. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Thank you. 